Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm sorry for the slight delay, the inevitable technical difficulties, um, but thank you very much for zooming in uh, to this webinar from Terra Firma on the Inquiries Act 2005. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Stuart Gale. I'm now the senior member of Terra Firma Chambers, and I'll be delivering the first talk on the role of the advocate in uh, the inquiries under the Act. Um, my perspective comes from really the last five years in which I've acted for a core participant, a group of survivors uh, in the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. Uh, prior to that, I spent probably a disproportionate amount of my career, now spending over 40 years at the bar, involved in inquiries of various types. And uh, uh, most of them were of what, what one would describe as the adversarial model. But I'll make some comments, if I may, in the course of this talk uh, on the change of approach, which I see as being the essential element uh, that is necessary if one is acting in an inquiry under the 2005 Act. Uh, the other speaker today is Dennis Edwards, who became a member of Terra Firma in 2012, and he has been a member of the English Bar, practicing from Normanton Chambers in London uh, since 2002. He's a, a distinguished academic record uh, having held posts at the University of Strathclyde, an assistant professorship at the City University of Hong Kong, um, as well as being a lecturer at the Universities of Glesson and Frankfurt, and a visiting professor at Tulane Law School. He's also held a human rights teaching fellowship at Columbia Law, Law School. Um, his public law knowledge is immense, and of course, you will likely know him uh, from his co-authorship of the standard text on judicial review in Scotland. Uh, we really couldn't have a better speaker to talk about challenging decisions uh, concerning inquiries uh, in the courts. Uh, this is, of course, one of a series of webinars this year uh, at which members of Terra Firma have presented and will continue to present talks on the core areas of our practice. Um, details of these webinars have been on our website and they are, they are available for viewing on our YouTube channel. Uh, and details of forthcoming webinars are also available on our website. Uh, the PowerPoint slides that will be we will be using will be emailed to all those of you who are attending uh, after the event and there will be uh, hopefully a recording posted on our YouTube channel which I have to say is the part of this that I dread the most. Uh, there will be a chance for questions and hopefully answers uh, at the conclusion uh, of the talks using the Q and A function. So to begin my talk, can I begin a little uh, by briefly indicating how we got uh, to the situation of inquiries under the 2005 Act? The Act was the first piece of primary legislation in the uh, best part of a century to provide a template for public inquiries. Uh, its predecessor, which was the Tribunals of Inquiry Evidence Act of 1921, did not provide any indication of the procedures to be followed in the event of an inquiry being constituted. Uh, and the generally procedures tended to follow uh, the adversarial model. Procedures could be eccentric. One only has to think of the Denning inquiry into the Profumo affair, where uh, everything was conducted in private. Lord Denning did all the questioning and there were no interested parties were not represented. Uh, the subject matter of the inquiry could also be a bit eccentric and, and discovered that in 
1957. It must have been something with the Macmillan government, I think. Um, it uh, oh, it uh, instituted an inquiry into the behavior of two policemen in Thurso uh, who had, uh, in old parlance, clipped some teenagers over the year for impudence. Um, Lord Sawn was appointed to chair the inquiry, senator of the college, uh, and uh, the counsel to the inquiry was James Shaw QC, who later became Lord Kilbrandon. Uh, so an embarrassment of talents, and one, one would think that probably not something that was necessary for a public inquiry. Even where uh, there is an inquiry, uh, the establishment uh, into a matter of genuine public concern. The remit can be such as to restrict the matters that one would expect to be considered. An example of this was the Clyde inquiry into the events in um, Orkney when children were removed from their, from their homes under the suspicion of uh, child abuse. Um, and the difficulty with that was that in fact, um, the question of, of whether abuse took place could never be answered, given the terms of the remit. There was a review of the workings of the 1921 Act. Um, it, was, it was ordered in 1966 under the chairmanship of Lord Salmon, and it produced uh, the six cardinal principles, which uh, continued until really their demise in the late part of the last, the last century. But essentially, they, at the crux of those six principles uh, was the adversarial nature uh, of inquiries. Could we have the first slide in the introduction, please? Uh, there is an interesting quote from, uh, as he then was, Sir Stephen Sedley, um, in that uh, he commented in 1989 uh, that the use of lawyers plays a significant part in what I have suggested uh, is a major function of inquiries, the organizing of controversy into a form more Catholic than litigation, but less anarchic than street fighting. I think it puts it reasonably well. Uh, can I give briefly a uh, anecdote from my first experience of a public inquiry? Because I, I actually witnessed the event that, that gave rise to this inquiry. Um, on the 2nd of August, 1973, uh, I was quite looking forward to that evening. As my father had given me authority to use his uh, newly acquired Triumph Dolomite, which for those of you who probably can't remember them, it was a car. Uh, and I was to take some family friends down to the airport at the other end of the Isle of Man where we lived. And as I came back, I was conscious of a a glow in the sky and a black pool of smoke. And uh, the slide that's on the screen now was what uh, confronted me. And that was a leisure center called Summerland. It was built um, in the late 1960s, contained a very large swimming pool, bars, restaurants, squash courts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it, the main part of it comprised a large metal frame uh, and in which, into which pyramidal sh shaped uh, perspex was uh, inserted. And, uh, and the fire began by accident. Some kids knocked over a kiosk where they were smoking. And uh, the whole thing was ablaze. Um, the material, which was the uh, acrylic, melted. And uh, I think I need to say what it was like. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, in total, 50 people were killed uh, within the building. Um, there was an inquiry launched very soon afterwards, chaired by the then Mr. Justice Cantley of the Northern Circuit. Um, uh, he determined the procedure and administration. The, the commission of inquiry began in November 73, concluded in February. 74. It sat for 49 days, took evidence from 91 witnesses. Uh, it uh, allowed parties who had an interest to cross-examine 
Uh, I went along to see some of the hearings and um, they were very impressive and well controlled. Um, the commission issued its report in May 1974 and it concluded that there'd been many human errors and failures, too much reliance on what was termed the old boy network, which allowed uh, necessary corners uh, to be rounded and short cuts taken. Uh, it issued uh, 34 recommendations. Um, I'll just refer to one of them, um, which was that there should be safeguards put in place uh, for the use of acrylic sheeting on multi-story public buildings. And it's perhaps a shame that those who thought 45 years later that it was a good idea to put sheeting on buildings such as Grenfell Tower didn't perhaps think of this uh, before they got to that point. Uh, that was, it was an adversarial inquiry and in my view, with the benefit now of nearly 50 years of hindsight, uh, it worked very well. It determined the how and why. It made sensible recommendations. And importantly, it concluded within eight months of the events that it was uh, considering. It made certain conclusions or reached certain conclusions from which criminal liability and civil liability could be inferred. But those who were targeted in that way were not pilloried. And the relatives of those who died uh, did discover how their relatives died and the failings which had led to their deaths. So by the beginning of this century, uh, the idea that the optimum way to conduct a public inquiry was through the adversarial method had been the subject of considerable criticism. Uh, at the heart of uh, the issue was the concern that although an inquiry could not determine civil or criminal liability, um, it could criticize and therefore those who might be the subject of criticism should be entitled to representation and uh, the right to cross-examine uh, the essential salmon cardinal, cardinal principles. And perhaps the high point of criticism came in the arms to Iraq inquiry chaired by Sir Richard Scott. Uh, in which uh, he um, quoted with approval the quotation that's on screen now from an article by Sir Louis Blom Cooper. Uh, and it's there for you to read. Um, what I think probably was the tipping point uh, was the out of control Bloody Sunday inquiry, um, which was. Uh, set up by the Blair government almost immediately upon coming into office. It was, in, it was set up under the 1921 Act, uh, but it took 12 and a half years to report and cost 200 million pounds. Uh, accordingly, there was a clear need for reform of the inquiry system. Uh, and that was provided by the 2005 Act. And I mentioned, I should mention also the uh, supplementary rules, which are in Scotland, the inquiry rules, Scotland, uh, 2007. So can I say a few words about circumstances that might lead to the inquiry? Next slide, please. Um, section one, subsection one of the act empowers a minister to cause an inquiry to be held where it appears to him or her that any particular event have, have caused or are or are capable of causing public concern or there are there is public concern that particular events may have occurred uh, next slide please um in general terms circumstances are frequently uh, grouped into disasters or scandals uh, a disaster is probably something, or maybe something, or a misnomer. Uh, obviously, the term can be entirely opposite. Uh, one thinks of the Piper Alpha inquiry, the Dumblane school shootings, the Stockland explosion. Um, but various inquiries may focus on a single death. And uh, 
there have been examples of that uh, in England, the Bahamusa inquiry, the Azel Rodney inquiry, the Al Swede uh, inquiry uh, are particular examples. Those were examples where in England an inquest would not have been appropriate and were the situation to be in Scotland a fatal accident inquiry would not be appropriate. Um, I don't suggest that the death of a single person is not seen as a disaster for the family, but we have now the Sheku Bayou inquiry, uh, which has been commissioned, but I, I don't think it started its hearings yet. Um, and once the decision was taken by Crown Office not to prosecute uh, the police officers who were involved in the incident that led to Mr. Bayou's death, um, it was clear that uh, a fatal accident inquiry uh, was not appropriate, would have, would have been appropriate, save for the fact that the issue of Mr. Bayou's race became uh, to the fore. And the terms of reference for that inquiry, and the, these are on a subsequent slide, which I don't want to go to at this stage, but you will see it as we look at some of the terms of reference. Um, they are, uh, they make specific reference uh, to um, the actions of the officers, whether they were affected by Mr. Bio's actual or perceived race. Scandals um, as a subject of inquiry do bring with them their, their, their own problems because there may be focus on historic events and they may involve uh, multiple witnesses and the Scottish Child abuse inquiry is an obvious example of this, um, as is the now UK-wide uh, infected blood inquiry, which followed on from the uh, regrettable failure of the Penrose inquiry. Um, the remit of the Scottish child abuse inquiry, as I'll just call the abuse inquiry, if I may, um, concerns events which are, are within living memory. So that effectively takes us back to the 1930s. And um, indeed, we recently heard from applicants who were emigrated uh, either to Australia or Canada, both pre and during the Second World War. And they were all now in their 80s, and the majority gave evidence of a video link. Um, and they were asked to re remember distressing matters from their childhood. Um, and very often those who are, I hesitate to use the word victims because I know it's not very uh, popular, but those who may be seen as victims um, in an inquiry setting uh, have possibly suffered injustice or unfairness. And many will bring with them to the inquiry uh, those feelings and the process of giving evidence uh, uh, just will likely display the consequences of what has happened to them in the past, and often, as a consequence, uh, they have as a consequence they have a distrust of officialdom, which extends to the to the inquiry, which they see as a manifestation of that. I'll come in more detail to uh, this in a later slide. Um, but in many instances, inquiries do have to establish the trust of those who are participants in them. And an aspect of that process uh, is to remove the adversarial uh, aspect uh, of an inquiry. So the street fighting that Sir Stephen Sedley spoke of has to go. Um, adv advocates who are instructed in these uh, inquiries uh, do play uh, a prominent and essential role in assisting the inquiry to achieve all this. And um, using the words of Sir Louis Blum Cooper from the earlier quotation, but in a slightly different context, as an advocate, you have to elbow out your adversarial tendencies. And uh, I'll look uh, in due course at the, briefly at the role of uh, counsel to the inquiry and counsel to a core participant. But where one is dealing with a core participant, 
One is essentially an advisor to your client with the crucial role of commenting on the evidence led in the inquiry. Uh, it is only possibly in the commenting that your adversarial tendencies may come to the fore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are a number of things that can be achieved by an inquiry, and I just list them and you can see them on the side. The first is fact finding. And um, there's a quote there from formerly Sir Geoffrey Howe, then, then Lord Howe in 1999. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Acknowledgement and accountability make the point that uh, it's not a substitute for civil litigation or criminal prosecution. But there is an opportunity for uh, organizations to acknowledge and to account for, uh, before the inquiry, uh, wrongdoings in the past. Indeed, uh, the child abuse inquiry has become almost a competition by on the part of various organizations to rearrange in different way the words um, unreserved, unqualified, uh, comprehensive uh, public apology for the abuse that may have occurred. Um, although now, fortunately, the word may seems to have been dropped. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, catharsis, this is possibly a slightly naive uh, thought, but uh, it, it is one that uh, is often thought appropriate, particularly the uh, possibility of bringing uh, protagonists together and uh, the restoring of public confidence is obviously uh, a significant matter. And finally, next slide, please. Uh, the prevention of reoccurrence. Um, learning lessons, making recommendations, and the possibility of reviewing future changes in legislation. And those are all, all parts of the terms of reference of the uh, child abuse inquiry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the I deal of, briefly with the mechanics of an inquiry in the terms of reference. And uh, there I quote from the annual report on, of the Council on Tribunals from 1995. Essentially, the terms have to be specific. They have to be precise. And if you have an opportunity as an advisor to an interested party to make comment on the terms of reference, uh, you should be satisfied as best you can that the terms of reference do in fact meet your client, what your clients seek. Because trying to push the envelope of the inquiry or in the terms of reference of the inquiry in the course of the inquiry is not likely to succeed. Next slide. Um, uh, I contain here uh, some references to um, uh, section five, subsection five, which contains what has to be within the uh, terms of reference. Um, I should make reference, and it, it's not actually on the side for which I apologize, but section five, subsection three does allow for alteration of the terms of reference uh, that has happened in the child abuse inquiry in that the initial time scale that was set for the inquiry had to be extended because of the early difficulties with the inquiry and uh, obviously that simply the, the amount uh, of material that the inquiry has to go through. Um, one thing you will note, um, and can we go to the next slide, please. One thing you will note that um, the child abuse inquiry is confined to the abuse of children in care. And uh, the full terms of, of that, of the terms of reference are on that slide on the following slide. But uh, at the moment, the inquiry is, con uh, is conducting a, a case study uh, into abuse which occurred in uh, independent boarding schools. There is and can be no inquiry like this inquiry uh, into what happened in independence or state, state schools where there is no boarding facility. And while it's not an issue and isn't, it's never been an issue for my client, um, it does seem to me 
that uh, that is a, an area given that, that there has been an inquiry, there has been a case study into schools uh, that is perhaps uh, uh, something that should have been considered. Similarly, of course, abuse in sports clubs and the various convictions, particularly those associated with professional uh, football clubs or associated with professional clubs. Football clubs, again, can't be uh, considered. Uh, the next slide, please, is simply the terms of reference for the Grenfell Town. I'll just give you that uh, out of interest. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, and the next. And the next. And then um, the public inquiry into the death of Sheikh Abayo. Uh, mentioned this already. And if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, in the bullet point, the penultimate bullet point, uh, consideration uh, of the actions of, of the officers involved, whether they were affected by his actual or perceived race. Um, against that, um, I make a couple of observations concerning the appointment of the inquiry uh, panel. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, this is governed by statute and it's uh, section three, four, seven and eight of the act. Um, it may be conducted by a chair alone or by a panel uh, of other members or a chair with other members. And the appointing minister requires to ensure that the inquiry panel has as a whole the necessary expertise. So it's, uh, put bluntly, it, it's a satisfaction that the chair and the members of the panel uh, have the expertise and it's often referred to as horses for courses. Um, where the um, uh, appointment um, does uh, extend onto other panel members, um, the uh, section 81A uh, does require expertise and uh, put shortly diversity. Uh, um, Dennis will deal with the poor Nazareth, poor sisters of Nazareth case, uh, and I simply, it's there, and he will deal with it in more detail. Uh, and assessors uh, can be appointed uh, to the inquiry. Um, section nine deals with the impartiality of the chair and the, and the panel members. Um, and again, um, Returning to the child abuse inquiry, there was initially a, a, a problem there. Um, the original chair uh, had to uh, step down for after some uh, slightly ill-advised public comments. Um, and one of the other members of the panel resigned at the same time, and that um, left with her appointment, Lady Smith and one other member of the panel. Unfortunately, that member of the panel, uh, while sitting as a uh, at the first public hearing of the uh, inquiry, um, was apparently still making applications for other jobs, one of which he got and one of which then conflicted him. So Lady Smith uh, was left um, to uh, continue the inquiry on her own. Now, um, I've been involved in this inquiry now for five years, and uh, I'll make my position very plain. Uh, I consider that Lady Smith and her team of counsel and uh, solicitors are doing an extraordinary job in the work uh, on this inquiry, um, particularly given the complexity and extent. She has restored the trust in the inquiry, which was damaged by the initial events and um, the uh, giving of evidence uh, in the inquiry has really been facilitated by the informal way that she has operated. Um, recently, as I said, we had uh, witnesses, one witness, an elderly gentleman did come from uh, Australia, and I think I think if, if one want, wish to consider a, 
a typical Australian, and I say this as a grandson of an Australian, uh, it was this man. And in the course of giving his evidence, uh, Lady Smith was Smithy, and uh, Colin Macaulay, the inquiry counsel, was Curly. So it was uh, that sort of informality still allowed him to give his evidence. Um, next slide, please. Um, the inquiry team uh, and their, uh, the role of inquiry counsel. Um, the inquiry personnel uh, in terms of counsel and solicitors are likely to be your point of contact with the inquiry. And uh, I've had a number of, uh, plain to say, uh, robust conversations with both in the context of the abuse inquiry but again, as an advocate acting for a core participant, you need to appreciate what their roles are. Inquiry counsel is entirely impartial. And the way in which he or she presents the evidence is a presentation of information. It's not cross-examination. Uh, and having seen it in action, it requires a great deal of skill. Uh, and uh, um, that's whether it's witnesses to uh, speak to events uh, that they have experienced or in relation to experts who are giving evidence. The ingathering of information uh, is uh, essentially dictated by Section 21 of the Act. From the point of view of an advocate representing an in, uh, a party, uh, you may uh, be given information by your client um, and uh, with a request that by your client that that is passed on to the inquiry team. Uh, if, you, if that does occur, uh, my approach and my view is that you pass it on to the inquiry team and it is for the inquiry team to make a decision on, on that. Um, the, the inquiry will very likely um, prepare a database of evidence which will be separate from its website um, and um, you will be given as counsel uh, to the uh, as counsel to a core participant access to that database under a strict obligation of confidenti confidentiality. Uh, and indeed, you will be uh, required uh, to, I think, uh, sign a, a confidentiality undertaking. Um, please be very careful um, in disclosing any information either to your client or to uh, advisors. Uh, and my would, advice would be that if you are minded to do so, or you think it would be useful to do so, uh, discuss it with the inquiry team beforehand before you do. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, procedure is a matter for the chair and uh, simply refer to core participants. Opening and closing statements are where your role does come in. Uh, opening statements are likely to be very brief. Um, the child abuse inquiry tends to restrict them to about five minutes, other than those by uh, inquiry counsel. And similarly, closing statements um, are relatively brief. Um, for core participants in the abuse inquiry, they tend to be about 30 minutes. Um, but the um, uh, those that are presented by inquiry council will be inevitably much longer. And it's really um, during closing uh, submissions that you have an opportunity to exercise your advocacy skills. You can obviously comment on the evidence that has been led, um, but you should be restrained in what you say. Uh, although certain witnesses and their approach to the inquiry may make them fair game. Um, you may wish also to suggest findings of fact that the inquiry uh, may want to make. And similarly, you may wish to make recommendations, uh, make suggested recommendations. Um, the uh, recommendations um, in the child abuse inquiry, because thus far the uh, call the case studies have all related to individual subject matter. The 
recommendations you simply store up, you don't make them uh, at this stage. One of the aspects of uh, procedure in an inquiry uh, that really does cause a problem uh, if you brought up on the adversarial model uh, is uh, the absence of an automatic right uh, to um, put questions. And I refer to rule nine, and you can read that for yourself, mindful of the time. Um, this does re require a, a change of legal mindset because in the child abuse inquiry, the, the restriction on putting questions, which requires essentially the leave of the chair to do so, is further refined because one has to put questions through the inquiry council and you require to do so in terms of a protocol that Lady Smith issued uh, a number of, I think it's three days in advance of the um, uh, witness, uh, the, the scheduled date for the witness giving evidence. Uh, and it's up to inquiry counsel uh, whether he or she uh, asks the question. So that matter at his, his or her discretion. Um, my tendency is to use this pretty sparingly, um, but when I do, uh, I tend to put questions in specific terms uh, as if I were asking the question. But again, there is no obligation on counsel to the inquiry to follow that. Um, one of the problems that this does tend to create is a, a disappointment uh, on, your, on the part of your client. And um, what I mentioned on the slide is the need to manage um, your client's expectations. Um, my client in the child abuse inquiry was, and I'm not breaching any confidences because uh, his name is disclosed in the reports uh, and um, uh, there have been findings of fact in relation to him. Uh, but he was, um, horribly abused by a house parent in Quarriers. And that house parent was uh, convicted of that abuse, served a lengthy period of imprisonment. During that period of imprisonment, he continued to maintain his um, uh, innocence. He continued to maintain his innocence after his release. He maintained his innocence in a statement he gave to the inquiry. And needless to say, my client, um, uh, wanted him to be taken to task over this. Um, it's not possible to do that. Um, the, the conviction of him was taken as a datum and the uh, concern uh, of regarding his, uh, his protestations was simply um, ignored. So it is important, uh, as I say, to uh, manage your client's expectations. Next slide, please. Uh, standard of proof, I'll say very little about this. Um, this is a determination uh, uh, for the discretion of the chair because both the act and the rules are silent. Uh, the proponent of view is that the standard should be the civil standard of balance of probabilities. And there's no precedent for it being uh, the criminal standard. Uh, there have been some, um, and, and that I should say is, is the view taken in the uh, child abuse inquiry. Um, although interestingly, um, Lady Smith did say that balance of probabilities is not appropriate where it comes to assessing future risk. There is no need to be satisfied that a particular harm will probably happen. It is enough that the established facts provide a sound basis the conclusion that there is a real possibility of it happening. And that's in her uh, decision issued in January 2018 uh, on uh, standard of proof. Um, there are several inquiries in which standard of proof has been um, set out. Um, if you want to look at them, there's the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry in, in Northern Ireland, uh, the Baha Musa Inquiry, the Al Swaidi inquiry, the Azal Rodney inquiry, also uh, the Shipman inquiry, and indeed the Leveson inquiry. There has been some confusion um, 
regarding the use of expressions uh, in other inquiries, such as a nuanced approach or a flexible and variable standard. Um, this is, in my view, slightly unfortunate, uh, as it was suggested in uh, the Baha Musa inquiry that the use of phrases such as I am sure or I have no doubt or I am certain could indicate um, a finding to uh, the criminal standard. And other phrases such as I find or I accept or it is likely or I believe or it seems would reflect findings to a civil standard. This is probably less of an issue than it may seem. Uh, all inquiries uh, seem to have indicated that the baseline standard is that of balance of probabilities and uh, an experienced judge uh, or lawyer uh, should be able to emphasize the clarity of the evidence and the strength of the finding without suggesting that finding has been achieved, has been achieved or arrived at uh, other than on the balance of probabilities. Um, final slide, thank you. Some concluding thoughts. Um, and being perfectly honest, um, some years ago, I gave a similar talk to this uh, in another jurisdiction, and I concluded that, in my opinion, the benefits of the inquisitorial system were limited. And that was principally based on the inability to uh, robustly challenge um, uh, evidence. Um, I have changed my mind. Um, having experienced the um, child abuse inquiry and the inquisitorial uh, method. And I think in uh, inquiries, certainly of that type, um, it works extremely well and I commend it. Is there a place for adversarial inquiries still? Um, I think there is. Um, and I give this, this example very briefly, the Trident was a fishing boat that sank off the northwest, uh, the northeast coast on its way back to uh, Fraserburgh. And um, uh, she sank without a trace, no distress call, uh, no wreck was found. That was in 1975. There was an inquiry immediately afterwards under the Merchant Shipping, Shipping Acts. Um, and um, it concluded simply that the Ship had, the, the boat had been swamped. Um, that, that's all that could be concluded. Um, in the late 1990s, the wreck of the Trident was found on the seabed by some divers, and it was examined, um, and it ruled out the possibility that there'd been a, a catastrophic failure. And uh, the inquiry from 1975 was um, reopened. Um, now. One of the problems which I, I do see in particularly in disaster inquiries is the lack of provision that may be given to parties who have an interest in the form of expert assistance. That was overcome in the Trident inquiry through the formation of what was a joint panel of experts. Um, each party uh, involved in the inquiry appointed an expert to a panel. That panel um, then produced a report um, there was a dissent from that report by one expert uh, in relation to the static and dynamic stability of the boat. But it worked very well. Uh, it took a long time, it was 50 days in the, the inquiry, but it worked well. In conclusion, uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, there's a quote uh, from, uh, and I recommend it to anybody who wants to read it, uh, Sir Louis Van Cooper's book, Public Inquiries, Wrong Route on Pub Bloody Sunday. Uh, in that, he says that the role of counsel is on tap rather than on top, and I cannot put it any better. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll now pass over to Dennis uh, for his talk. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about briefly uh, about uh, the role of the court in relation to uh, inquiries. Uh, and before I begin, can I just apologize? There is some background noise because the local authority has decided to prune uh, trees today. 
so um, I apologize if there's some background noise. Um, I, I was in my, my particular experience of inquiries uh, was in the context of Iraq abuse inquiries um, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and I was one of the disclosure council in relation to one uh, aspect of the abuse inquiries involving somewhere called Camp Breadbasket. Um, and suffice to say, it, it was an unsatisfactory experience at a variety of levels. Um, there was a lot of information that had to be um, found uh, and it was all diffuse information spread in many different places and had to be uh, ingathered. Uh, and there was a sort of abiding feeling uh, that uh, my client's heart wasn't in it um, for various reasons, uh, perhaps some of which were justified in light of subsequent events in that one of the leading uh, solicitors pursuing these complaints, uh, a Mr. Phil Shiner, was eventually struck off um, as far as I remember. Um, anyway, that's just my personal um, experience. Now, for present purposes, um, the few slides that I have focus on uh, judicial review challenges um, to inquiries. Um, but I, I should probably begin by saying, um, I, as the last uh, bullet point in this slide suggests, that judicial review of inquiries um, doesn't necessarily exhaust uh, the relevance of the courts to inquiries. So, um, as um, Stuart mentioned earlier, um, there is um, there are provisions in the Inquiries Act which concern. Uh, the role of the courts in assisting inquiries in, 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 in requiring attendance of witnesses, producing evidence and documents and so on. Uh, and and you, you, you will see those provisions in sections 21 and 36 of the 2005 Act. Uh, and, and Stuart also touched on the potential devolution implications uh, for inquiries um, arising out of whether an inquiry is a UK inquiry or a Scottish inquiry. And so I'm not going to um, be distracted by, by, by them at the moment. Um, but it, it's right to say at the beginning uh, that, that the potential for judicial review it does not necessarily exhaust uh, the relevance of the courts in, in supporting inquiries. But for present purposes, um, what is of interest is the scope for judicial review of inquiries. Uh, and in relation to that, going back to the top of the slide, um, there are basically th th three timelines um, for a potential judicial review challenge. Uh, the first uh, would be before the inquiry commences. Uh, the second would be during the inquiry. Uh, um, for example, in relation to decisions made by the, the inquiry chair. Uh, and then the third, uh, and by far the most difficult, uh, would be um, the prospect of uh, an inquiry uh, the, the challenging the conclusions of an inquiry. In other words, after the inquiry has reported, seeking to challenge the, uh, the conclusions of the inquiry. So uh, present focus is on judicial review um, during any of these um, timescales. Um, uh, but the starting point, I think we have to acknowledge right at the beginning, is that um, with respect to all potential judicial reviews of inquiries, uh, there is a discernible judicial reluctance to interfere in matters which have been committed to an inquiry. Um, of course, um, one might say, well, Parliament has, um, by, by, by enacting the Inquiries Act 2005, taken the view that certain matters should be for the inquiry. Uh, the courts should, therefore should not be involved. Uh, and equally, the decision to set up an inquiry will often be a political one, which 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 the courts will um, be, be reluctant to um, um, look at. Um, so can we move to the next slide then? And here we are going to begin briefly with pre-inquiry challenges. So this would be a challenge um, before the inquiry begins. Um, and it's unlikely, I think, for common sense reasons, that there would be a challenge to the decision to hold an inquiry. I mean, I can't think of one immediately. Um, but there has been some litigation on decisions not to hold an inquiry. Um, and so the first of those, um, the Al Swede case there, um, was about an initial uh, reluctance of the government to hold an inquiry into alleg various allegations uh, be made by Mr. Al Swede. I can't remember now what, what they were. I think it was um, a series of allegations about British soldiers um, shooting injured people. 
uh, during the Iraq war. But eventually, an, a, a limited al Swedi inquiry, I think, did take place and eventually reported. Uh, more recently, um, there is this um, repeat, reprieve decision. Um, many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with ongoing litigation arising out of the, the so-called war on terror, um, where rendition of suspects uh, has taken place and people have been tortured, I and mean, I don't think allegedly, I think in some cases certainly tortured, uh, in order to get evidence from them. Um, and uh, the British government decided it wasn't going to have an inquiry into uh, the British authorities' involvement in, in these arrangements, uh, and reprieve challenged challenge that decision not to hold an inquiry unsuccessfully, uh, I, I'm bound to say. So certainly some prospect um, for challenging decisions uh, not to have uh, an inquiry, um, although that, that is going to be difficult to uh, fi find, find a, a ground of unlawfulness, um, subject, subject to perhaps Article 3 uh, considerations, which I'll come to briefly later. Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights Issues, which we'll briefly mention later. Uh, there is a Northern Irish case um, in which uh, a challenge has been made to the terms of reference for an inquiry. Um, and you know, logically, one can see some potential there um, if someone's not happy with an inquiry's limitations or exclusions. Um, there was debate around the Grenfell inquiry about this. Um, I don't think there was any judicial review. Um, but uh, what one can see um, some potential for uh, arguing in court uh, about the rationality of um, the matters committed or um, not committed to an inquiry. Uh, another potential area of challenge, of course, is um, about the panel members. Um, and Stuart mentioned uh, the Poor Sisters of Nazareth case. Um, and in that case, um, many of you will remember a challenge was taken to uh, the appointment of Miss Susan O'Brien, uh, Queen's Counsel, as the chair of the child abuse inquiry. Uh, basically on the basis that some years previously she had acted um, in, uh, in, a, in a case, in a, in a, in a claim uh, for, for abuse which had gone to the, the House of Lords um, and that um, she was biased or maybe she, she might be biased or more likely she, she might have some prejudgment uh, among other things uh, given uh, her, her uh, interest uh, and experience in relation to um, these the, of claims of abuse and s seeking to have the time limit for abuse uh, extended uh, and so on. And now that um, claim uh, was unsuccessful, um, largely because um, the, the court accepted that counsel, um, when they act in a case, of course, are performing the role of an advocate or a barrister in England, uh, and they have no, no necessary identification uh, with the perspective of their client. Uh, uh, and so simply because uh, counsel has um, had instructions for a client in a particular case doesn't, doesn't at all give rise to any, uh, any, um, any sense of prejudgment uh, in, the, in the eyes of a, of a reasonably well-informed observer. Um, the English case, De Silva, uh, more recently, similar sorts of issues uh, in relation to the undercover policing inquiry in uh, in Italy, in, in England, sorry, but not um, not, uh, yeah, not not successful again. Um, and then finally, um, there will also be the potential for pre-inquiry challenges uh, about early decisions as to how the inquiry will be run. So for example, in the Azelle Rodney inquiry in England, um, decisions had been, making about, had been made about allowing witnesses to give evidence behind a screen that was challenged. Um, and in another, in another a Northern Irish case, um, decisions on uh, restricting by the panel to restrict uh, the questioning of witnesses to inquiry counsel was challenged on the basis that other participants wanted to be able to pose questions as well. Now, these challenges were also unsuccessful, but that doesn't mean to say they would always be unsuccessful. Um, and you, know, you can see there, you can get a flavor of the sorts of pre-inquiry uh, opportunities that there might be to challenge decisions made in the setting up of an inquiry. Um, so if we move then to the uh, next, um, down the line, if you like, when the inquiry is now up and running, 
Um, here, there's definitely been a lot more scope um, and indeed a lot more scope for successful challenges to decisions made by inquiry members. Um, and the key case here is um, the first or the, or the two cases against Lord Savile, uh, who was the chair of the Bloody Sunday inquiry. And although these were separate cases, um, they were on related themes. Uh, the first um, case concerned a decision of the, uh, the Bloody Sunday inquiry to uh, allow the identity of soldiers who had been in Northern Ireland or around the scene at the time to be revealed. Um, and that was challenged. Uh, and then the second decision uh, was, um, the second case uh, concerned a decision to um, uh, have hearings take place in Londonderry at, at which soldiers involved would be required to attend. Now, this, the main theme of both cases was that this posed a risk um, to the witnesses, to the soldiers involved. Uh, and the court um, in both cases agreed with that. They essentially agreed that the decisions of the panel were unfair uh, and or irrational. So we see therefore that there is certainly a potential um, to challenge decisions uh, made um, as the inquiry proceeds um, about how evidence is to be obtained, the identity of witnesses, what is to be published uh, and so on. Now, at the risk of oversimplification, um, I think that the first, particularly the first Savile case, um, remains a place to look to, um, to find out what the court's um, considerations are likely to be in any inquiry, in any chat judicial review challenge to an inquiry. It's a pretty exhaustive review of, of the law that should apply to, to inquiries. So even though it predates um, the Inquiries Act, um, it, it's still referred to in, in most of, certainly in most of the later English cases. Um, and again, at the risk of oversimplification, as I say there, I, th I think what comes out, in my view, what comes out of the first Savile case is that the standard expected by the courts is one of fairness. Uh, and the court will look at most challenges, irrespective of how they're dressed up. I mean, obviously, potentially all the grounds of judicial review are available. But the one that seems to um, be focused on uh, is fairness. Uh, and so even an irrationality challenge um, basically, basically turns into a, a dressed up fairness challenge. Um, and perhaps that's not surprising given what um, Stuart was saying earlier about the culture you know, following the Salmon inquiry and so on in, in a report in the 60s, that this was applying judicial processes to inquiries it's perhaps not surprising that when any issue about an inquiry comes to the court, uh, what the court is ultimately concerned with is, is fair procedures and that you know, people have a proper notice, an opportunity to respond, an opportunity to question, uh, or, or that there's any risk um, to, their, to their life or health um, brought about by the, uh, by, by the inquiry's decisions. So it seems to me that fairness is, is it will invariably be the litmus test <clears throat> in assessing whether the, the inquiry has come to a lawful decision <clears throat> on, on a, you know, for want of a better expression, on an interlocutory matter. Um, and I think we see that in a way also in the uh, two more recent Scottish cases in Billfinger and most recently in the, in the Lady Smith case that Stuart mentioned. Uh, Billfinger uh, was about a, a decision to publish uh, what was uh, alleged by the challenger to be commercially sensitive information. Um, uh, but it seems to me that what, what the matter comes down to, and again, to cut, cut, cut things short, cut, cut things short and just simply summarize in a rough and ready way, what it comes down to is, is whether or not the, um, the inquiry had made a fair decision um, it had heard from Bill Finger about what Bill Finger's concerns were, where it had properly considered them, uh, and it had come to a decision which in all circumstances was one that was fair um, in, in the conduct of the inquiry. Uh, the Lady Smith case involved a number of other uh, considerations, um, but at the end of the day, it, it was about a concern uh, that the judge was a, a judge in her own cause. Um, and um, you know, although reading between the lines in Lord Boyd's opinion, there are some concerns about fairness issues um, to the BBC, um, that they were not enough to um, displace um, the conclusion that um, 
in all the circumstances, um, Lady Smith had, had, had come to a, a fair and correct decision and she wasn't uh, a judge in her own cause. And of course that expression um, invokes considerations of bias and prejudice again, which ultimately comes back to fairness. So um, I, 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 my view is uh, that most challenges during the course of an inquiry will come down um, to some issue of, of fairness. Um, the final point I would make here is that uh, there will be some tactical issues or sensitive issues that might have to be made um, by a prospective challenger as to um, whether to bring a challenge during the course of the inquiry. Um, there is a risk that uh, there will be a delay to the inquiry. Um, and so that has to be balanced uh, against um, proceeding in any event. Uh, but also to be considered is that there may be more difficulty to raise the issue that you're now concerned about at the end of the inquiry. Uh, and as we're about to see, challenging inquiry conclusions um, is, is very difficult. Uh, it, but it could be, of course, that what's very important and um, uh, you know, a real hot potato now won't be so won't be so important or crucial or significant um, after the inquiry has reported. Um, and indeed, in the in the BBC and Lady Smith case, there was an element of that um, as to whether you know a year later, after the BBC's initial concerns, um, the inquiry has not yet reported, of course, but um, whether the decision to challenge a year later um, was you know, had the importance uh, that it had to the BBC at the time uh, a year earlier. So this is a difficult issue. Um, I suppose if, um, like in the Savile cases, if the challenge in, is at an early stage, um, then the inquiry can get on with other work um, um, a bit while, while, while the court resolves um, the, the issue. Um, but of course, the, the, the longer into the inquiry that, 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 that um, we are, um, if a fundamental issue arises, then of course there is a risk that the thing will have to stop, um, and, and that has that has difficulties um, by way of delay, um, for which will affect many people who may not be so interested in the issue you are. So it seems to me there are there are difficult um, judgments that have to be made, difficult assessments that have to be made uh, in relation to challenges during the inquiry. Uh, and then finally, uh, that brings us to the next um, issue then, which is post-inquiry challenges. Um, and, and here I, I would be most pessimistic. I think um, I can't think of any, um, certainly not in the UK. I think there is a New Zealand case in the Privy Council. Um, uh, arguably, I think it was about fairness. Uh, again, but in the UK, um, it, it's hard to think of any post-inquiry challenge. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, it seems to be a number of practical reasons for that. Um, the first problem, perhaps the most significant, um, is, uh, and the traditional analysis, is that inquiries strictly don't make um, any decisions. Uh, they make recommendations. Uh, inquiries as the Inquiries Act makes clear, uh, do not make decisions on civil rights or civil liability or criminal sanctions. Uh, so that they're only making recommendations at the end of the day. Uh, and of course, recommendations may not be followed. Uh, in fact, I saw one survey um, that said that the record of ministers following, rec at least in the UK, of following recommendations is, is not great. Um, so that um, arguments about whether the conclusions of a recommend of, a, of an inquiry are irrational, you know, it just seems to me uh, would be the, the main challenge. And I accept that there might be a potential for a jurisdictional challenge that they've gone beyond their terms of reference and so on. Um, but you know, given that it's uh, eminent judges and senior lawyers who are um, cha usually chairing inquiries they are going to be pretty sensitive, it seems to me, to their jurisdictional limitations and following their remit in terms of reference. So that in practice, um, any challenge to an inquiry conclusions is likely to be on irrationality grounds. Um, and, and why bother, basically, if, if the recommendations may not be followed? Um, you know, maybe you want to wait until um, ministers decide to follow the recommendations by publishing new guidance or whatever and then challenge that, that decision, I suppose, rather than the inquiry one uh, itself. But, I mean, I would just add in a word of caution because that may state, that traditional analysis 
um, that um, what's the point of challenging inquiry conclusions maybe may just state matters too simply. Um, some inquiries potentially could lead um, to prosecution. Uh, it may be, um, you know, like in the Checo Bio case, I think the police, the Crown Office have said there won't be any prosecutions. In, arguably giving that undertaking helps the inquiry come to um, the conclusions and do its job. But um, it may be that the child abuse inquiry will, will lead to the risk of um, people being prosecuted so that the traditional analysis that inquiries don't, make, don't themselves make decisions uh, may be too simplistic in, in that although the inquiry won't lead to any uh, criminal sanctions. It could be that it's um, evidence heard during it or findings made by it might then lead on to someone um, facing liability, criminal or civil. So you know, I, I think um, there is some scope for, for, for just being cautious about the, uh, the analysis that says inquiries don't make any decisions. How, there may be some more scope um, for post-inquiry challenges where the issue is a reasons one. Um, seems to me that a reasons challenge may be more promising if, if the inquiry has not properly reasoned some conclusion or recommendation uh, and someone feels aggrieved about that. Now, that then leads on to the wider issue, which I touched on earlier, which is the issue of the inadequate inquiry. Uh, now, it, where we don't have a human rights issue, it, it's hard to think what the legal basis for challenging an inquiry as being inadequate is. But there will be certain types of inquiries where there are legal standards against which the adequacy of the inquiry must be judged. Uh, and these arise from, certainly from Article 3 um, and arguably Article 8 of the European Convention. Um, uh, and I, many of you will know that Article 3 does impose both um, procedural and substantive requirements uh, in relation to uh, an inquiry where someone has lost their life uh, because of the right to life. Uh, and there have been quite a few cases, both in the Strasbourg court and in the English court, um, where the, the matter concerns whether loss of life or torture is attributable to state actors. So you have the Vasiliev and uh, Russia case in the Strasbourg court, which is, I think, a good starting point. Uh, and as I say, there have been a number of, of English cases, but the, the AM case <clears throat> in 2009 in the Court of Appeal, there are also some Supreme Court, House of Lords and Supreme Court decisions, but uh, the AM case uh, involved Lord Justice Elias and Lord Justice Sedley, to eminent Court of Appeal judges uh, in recent times, and there's a pretty extensive review of the authorities. Uh, and again, uh, the later it concerned a fire in an immigration detention centre, as I recall, uh, and what the obligations on the state were um, to have a proper and adequate inquiry. So it seems to me that um, beyond the, the ECHR context, it's hard to see what the legal grounds would be for arguing that an inquiry was inadequate. But certainly where there's a right to life, a torture, I think also human trafficking issue, uh, there are human rights obligations uh, which lead to standards against which the adequacy of an inquiry can be judged. Um, I suppose it's also possible that a bias issue could arise ex post facto uh, and that someone then feels that that needs to be revisited. Uh, and that the refusal to reconvene uh, or reopen an inquiry, I suppose, could be, could be, could be judicially reviewed on, on that basis too. So next slide. Um, and uh, remedies. Uh, just the final point, obviously, all the usual remedies uh, will be available normally. There will normally not be any right of appeal from an inquiry. Um, in Scotland, it's usual JR principles that apply. So you have to ask for permission within three months of the decision that you are being, uh, you're, you're upset about. Um, there is a provision in the Inquiries Act section 38, which imposes a stricter time limit for challenging inquiry decisions um, of 14 days, I think, um, but that doesn't apply to Scotland. It's interesting that it doesn't apply to Scotland, of course, in 2005. Um, there was no permission and uh, strict time limit as there is now, so it may be that there's a lacuna there and that and there's no obvious reason why the time limits should be stricter in England than they are in Scotland, but, but you know, I don't know the reasoning why Section 38 doesn't apply to Scotland, uh, but it may have something to do with the fact that the um, changes to the judicial review procedure you know, came 10 years later and that one's just been missed as far as I can see. 
Um, as far as remedies themselves go, it seems to me the court, and even, even if one succeeds um, in a claim, uh, the court will be very careful, um, uh, mindful of the political background um, and that the matter is ultimately for the inquiry um, to craft a remedy which will intrude as minimally as possible into the inquiry's functions. Um, and you definitely see those sensitivities in both the Savile cases, but particularly the second one, um, about where the, where, you know, the location of the inquiry hearings. There is definitely a, a caution about um, dictating to the inquiry, and it's very much you know, sending the matter back to the inquiry to think again, r rather than the court saying, well, you know, that, that decision in, is, uh, is quashed, and um, we think that these are the standards by reference to which you should consider matters. Um, I think there is a, a sense, a particular sensitivity on remedial issues. Um, when, 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 in the event that a, a challenge um, is successful, uh, and then there is also the risk uh, we touched on earlier um, that by the time of deciding on any remedy, that the issue is academic, um, uh, and that that that's obviously a, a, an important um, consideration which a challenger has to bring as to whether it's to be now or leave it till later. But by the time you leave it till later, it may not may not um, matter at all. And so I think those are some of the considerations uh, that I would um, highlight in relation to potential judicial reviews on challenges. So thank you for that. So if there are any questions or answer, uh, well, whether there are any answers is, is, is um, not clear, but <laughs> first question, is whether there are any, any questions that might arise. <coughs> Hmm. I, I mean, I, if, I, if I can just ask one question to um, Stuart, um, the, the, uh, the Isle of Man inquiry that you mentioned, I mean, you, you gave some tantalizing insight into it there. Um, I, I mean, if I heard you right, a number of people did, did die in that fire. Yeah, there were 50 people who died in it. And uh, uh, it was, as I say, it was Mr. Justice Kentley who um, chaired it before he became infamous as the much parodied judge in the Jeremy Falk trial. Mm. And um, but uh, he, he did, as far as I could see, I was 18, so I was not exactly uh, an expert on these matters. Um, and he, he did, he did uh, conduct it very well. Mm -hmm. um, kept, I mean, there were some titans of the legal profession, I think Bob Alexander, QC mm -hmm. later, Lord, Whedon, Lord Alexander of Whedon was one of them. I think he, he represented the Oroglass manufacturers. So it, it, it was one that worked well. And um, as I say, it, it, it is, it's that sort of inquiry um, which probably could give adversarial inquiries a good name, uh, mm -hmm. but others unfortunately have gone off. and. I mean, I was involved um, many years ago now in what I think is still the longest running fatal accident inquiry in Scotland, which lasted for 130 odd days, um, arising out of a North Sea incident. And it was quite clear that many parties, including my own clients, uh, were using it um, for uh, as a as a, pre a preparation for litigation, civil litigation in other jurisdictions, principally America, obviously. So mm -hmm. um, it's uh, uh, that again, the inquiry probably uh, was lost control of, and I think that was one of the problems. And certainly, obviously, we have the um, um, Bloody Sunday inquiry, which is completely out of control. Well, I mean, that actually ties into a question that we've had actually from uh, someone, which is, um, do you see there ever being a rule brought in which sets time limits for an inquiry to set out recommendations? Uh, and the questioner says 12 and a half years seems a very long time for the Iraq inquiry. I mean, that, 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 that mm -hmm. absolutely had got, you know, went, went mm -hmm. way out of control. Yeah. 
uh, and then the Bloody Sunday inquiry went on forever, and, and the child abuse inquiries, I mean, look as if they're going to um, continue for a very long time. Both the child abuse inquiry in, um, in England and Wales under Professor Jay and the inquiry here under Lady Smith um, undoubtedly have, well, certainly here, I would think, some knowledge of what still has to be addressed. Mm. And I, I, I can't see um, the child abuse inquiry finishing in within the next three years. So yeah, I would say that I can. Time, it's total length of time will be will be seven years. So. I mean, I can see. I would say that there's a, it's a very interesting point. I mean, and I agree that some of these inquiries have gone way out of control in terms of the length of time they're taking and the cost. Uh, and I would say the precedent uh, might be the Heathrow Terminal Five inquiry in planning. In planning, mm. the Terminal Five at Heathrow inquiry went way out of control. I mean, yes. and it just went on forever, and the cost was absolutely horrendous. And directly or indirectly, that set that that led to the setting up, I think, of the Infrastructure Planning Commission or something. I think it's called, mm. and that the absolute policy reason uh, underlying it was clearly underlying it was to make uh, large infrastructure planning decisions um, much quicker, uh, much less costly, um, and with many less objections um, to have um, hearings and so on. Um, and you know, I think that really has speeded up decisions on large infrastructure projects, certainly in England. You know, in relation to the nuclear power, the nuclear power stations that are being proposed, or the extension of Sizewell, or whatever it is, um, you know, there's nothing like the Heathrow Terminal Five um, process anymore. So I, I would say that that does suggest that there, you know there will be concern in in in, in high places uh, about the length of time and the cost. And you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised that um, if um, you know if if if, if the government, uh, whether in Holyrood or Westminster, and um, you know, does become sufficiently concerned about it, then you know there is certain that, that, that I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was interest in introducing some um, process under which there is a maximum time limit for for inquiries. All right. Well, shall we leave it there then, Stuart? Well, and um, thank you for that question. Thank you very yeah. much for attending, everyone. Um, I think that was the last question. Yes. Uh, so we're going to leave it there then. Um, there are our contact details. Um, as Stuart said at the beginning, this is one of a series of seminars which Terra Firma is hosting. And we're all hopeful that we'll be able to do it face to face again in the not too distant yeah. future. Um, but thank you very much um, for coming and attending. And um, we look forward to hopefully to meeting in the future at some point. Thanks again. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Emma.